A viewer recommended I make this video, but it's also a band I really like, so I'm excited to talk about it. The Minutemen were a relatively short-lived phenomenon, and they never broke out of their small community, but they managed to inspire so many kids to follow in their footsteps. To make music and express yourself as a hobby with no intention of it becoming something more than that. And for that, if for nothing else, their story is important to tell. So this is the story of the Minutemen. Michael Watt was born in Virginia in 1957, but since his dad was in the Navy, the family moved around quite a lot. His mom was a secretary who sang in quite a few different groups when she was growing up. When he was 10, his family moved to San Pedro, California, and he ended up staying there after his parents divorced, living with his mom and his two sisters. When he was 13, Mike was walking through a park in San Pedro when another kid fell out of a tree and landed next to him. That guy's name was Dennis Boone, and he was playing army with some of his other friends, but once he fell out of the tree, he realized that those friends had ditched him. One of the friends he was playing army with was named Eskimo, so when Boone fell out of the tree, he looked at Mike and said, you're not Eskimo, to which Mike replied, no, I'm not. And that was that. He and Mike walked home together, started hanging out, and became best friends. On the way home, Boone entertained Mike with all of these intricate elaborate stories that all had these super clever punchlines, and Mike was just amazed at this new friend he had. He said, quote, I was such an idiot. I didn't know until we went to his house and he started playing them that it was George Carlin routines. End quote. Dennis, who went by D. Boone, was born in San Pedro in 1958. His father had also been in the Navy, but he retired and was at that time installing car radios. Boone didn't know much about the popular music of the day. He grew up listening to country bands because that's what his dad liked. So Mike introduced him to bands like The Who and Blue Oyster Cult. Boone lived in a pretty tough area, so his mom encouraged Mike and Boone to start a band. She thought it would keep him out of trouble, so they got some cheap instruments from a pawn shop and just started playing around with them. Boone's mother taught Boone how to play guitar, and she encouraged Mike to play the bass even though they really had no idea what the difference was between the two. They didn't understand that the strings being more loose on a bass changed the way they sound. They thought it was just like a preference for the guitarist. Mike said, quote, I only had four strings on my guitar because that's what I thought a bass was. I took the B and the E string off, and now it was a bass. I didn't know it was tuned lower. I had no idea. End quote. Mike said that a neighbor once asked Boone's mom how she could stand being in a house with the kids making that much racket, to which she replied, quote, Well, I know where my son is. End quote. They taught themselves how to play mostly by sitting in a room and listening to the radio and just attempting to play along to the songs that they liked. Boone said, quote, We'd sit in my room and rehearse. Well, not rehearse. We'd play one riff over and over again. End quote. But Boone did eventually start taking guitar lessons from a local teacher named Roy Mendez Lopez. Mike and Boone played a lot together, meticulously practicing what they heard on records and what they heard on the radio, sometimes with Boone's brother playing drums with them. Through all of that rehearsing and his lessons he was taking, Boone actually became pretty well-versed in the guitar, which was kind of rare for the punk scene that they would become a part of. They kept playing with each other all through high school, playing in different bands and just hanging out together. The month that they graduated, at high school, D. Boone's mother passed away, and Mike said that just tore their world apart. Boone was very close to his mother, and it was just a really hard thing for them to go through. They were actually really good students. D. Boone was really into history, and he was actually a pretty good painter, and Mike said that he found himself learning a ton about history and politics just to keep up with whatever Boone was talking about. And then for most musicians, that's where the story ends. You get really into playing music, you form some bands with your high school friends, and then you go to college, maybe you have a college band. Maybe once you graduate college, you play around with some friends on the weekends or just kind of like strum in your spare time, but it never really becomes anything. But when Mike and Dee Boone discovered punk music in 1976, it allowed them to write a different end to that story. They heard about punk bands through magazines like Cream and Crawdaddy, 
Mike said, quote, the journalist had a big effect on us. It was a world of ideas, end quote. There were two main ideas that really appealed to them about this new punk scene. The first one was the do-it-yourself ethos, this idea that you could make the music you wanted to make and you didn't need the financial backing of a major label. The second aspect they loved was the tight-knit community. When they joined the punk movement, it was really small and kind of closed off, and they really loved that closeness between the bands and the fans. They heard bands like The Ramones and The Clash, and they realized that these guys weren't using synths and overdubbing and touring with these elaborate stage shows like the arena rock bands of the day. It was the old school stuff that bands like The Who were doing. And they thought to themselves, we can do this. So they started taking more and more trips into downtown Los Angeles to hear the local punk bands playing. They mostly thought those bands kind of sucked, but they were really enthralled by the idea of they're up there doing it, so why can't we? In 1977, Mike and Boone joined a band called Starstruck, which isn't really a band that's worthy of much note, other than the fact that it was their first step into the punk world. But when that band broke up, they formed another one with a vocalist named Mike Tambourine. Tamborovich? I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know. Bad of pronunciation. Long-standing thing on this channel. And they also brought in a drummer named George Hurley. George was kind of an interesting figure in the punk community. He was originally from the East Coast, born in Massachusetts in 1958, but his family relocated to San Pedro when he was six, and his father worked on the docks as a machinist. Before he devoted himself to music, he was kind of that typical California surfer bro type person. Mike said, quote, he lived on the beach eating coconuts. End quote. But then he almost drowned while surfing in Hawaii, and that was the end of that. He traded his motorcycle for a drum set, made his own sticks out of plexiglass, and devoted himself to being the best drummer he could. His biggest drumming influences were actually jazz musicians. He said, quote, I'd go see Max Roach or some other great jazz drummer, and they'd have these kits that they pulled out of the trunk of their cars, three piece or four pieces, and they were doing things that I couldn't imagine. They were like magicians, end quote. Even though they went to the same high school and even graduated in the same year, George didn't meet Mike or D. Boone until after they graduated, because they just ran in completely different circles at that point. George met Mike at a friend's house at a party where Mike passed out in the bathroom with the door locked, locking them all out of the bathroom. Mike has repeatedly said that George joining this punk community was a really strange and hard thing for him. Whereas Mike and D. Boone were already the weird kids, it made sense for them to get into this kind of music. George took a lot of abuse for it, and he ended up getting in quite a few fights about this kind of like decision to step outside and do something different than what all of his friends were doing. So Mike, D. Boone, Martin, and George formed a band that they called the Reactionaries. George's mom had remarried to a guy who lived in another town, so she often wasn't home, which meant the guys were free to practice in a shed that was in George's backyard. They also did quite a lot of partying in that shed. At the time, the San Pedro music scene had not caught on to punk. Most of the local bands in that area spent their time playing covers of popular rock songs. So most of the people in the area didn't take the Reactionaries all that seriously. Then they went to a show and met a really tall guy who was handing out flyers for his band called Black Flag. They introduced themselves and talked about the reactionaries, so Greg Ginn invited them onto a bill with Black Flag. It was actually Black Flag's second ever show, and it devolved into an almost riot. About seven months later, they got tired of the typical frontman idea, and Mike and D. Boone started talking about a different band that they wanted to make, calling it The Minutemen. Let's go drink and pogo. So they broke up the reactionaries, and George went to join a kind of like new wavy group called Hey Taxi. So in early 1980, Mike and D. Boone spent a ton of time together just working on songs in D. Boone's room. Then they felt that they were ready to get back out there, so they started rehearsing a lot and playing a few gigs with a drummer named Frank Taunch, or Taunche, I'm, I'm sorry, don't know. The songs that they were working on were very short. They took inspiration from a band named Wire, whose debut album Pink Flag was 21 songs in 35 minutes. Having shorter songs allowed them to get in and get out without really needing to find their groove, and they described the lyrics at that time as basically just rants. Boone said, quote, we just say what we say, end quote. Frank lasted about six months before he got tired of the aggressive punk scene and left the band. Actually, he just walked off stage in the middle of an early gig after the crowd spit on him. 
which was unfortunate because that was right around the time that Greg Ginn asked if the Minutemen wanted to release a record through his new label called SST Records. So George kind of reluctantly agreed to rejoin them, and they recorded a seven-song EP called Paranoid Time in July of 1980, produced by Greg Ginn, and it was the second ever release by SST. The EP was recorded in tracklist order, and it featured, like, no overdubbing other than George's brother doing some backing vocals. Through this process, Greg taught Mike and Dee Boone what it was like and how they could actually put out a record, and it really inspired them. They also started sharing Black Flag's rehearsal space, which greatly impacted their sound. Mike said, quote, when you play with a band like that, you don't want to sound like them. If they were going to play that fast, heavy metal, then we couldn't do it. So we got this other stuff going, end quote. While they were getting the band going, Boone was in art school, but he dropped out, and Mike was going to school for electronics. But at that time, the only jobs that Mike would be able to get would be in the defense industry, which he didn't want to work in. So working on this punk band and these records became a lifesaver for them. It gave them something to do that was like a creative outlet and gave them some meaning and purpose in their day. They weren't picturing themselves being the next great rock and roll band. They were just making the music they wanted to make and having fun with their friends. And that was enough. Greg Ginn gave them little jobs at SST Records to kind of help them get by. In 1981, they released their debut LP called Punchline, which let them settle on their sound. It was 18 songs in 15 minutes. They recorded the album during a late night session when studio time was cheaper. They also used previously used tape and didn't use overdubbing, so the album was essentially a live album. A review in the magazine Trouser said that the album was, quote, worthy of your time. The Minutemen started to tour pretty heavily in support of this album, and local college radio stations started to pay attention to their songs. An influential DJ named Rodney Bigenheimer started to feature them on a show. By 1982, they had built up a pretty decent following, especially in the Los Angeles punk scene. While they were waiting for their second LP to come out, they released another EP called Bean Spill. And then in 1983, their second album, What Makes a Man Start Fires, came out. It was almost twice as long as Punchline, and some of the songs actually went over two minutes long. It was also the first album that wasn't all done in one night. They came back to the studio to do some overdubbing. Micah said that it was the band's first real album. Critics seemed to really like this album and remarked that the Minutemen appeared to be better musicians than a lot of their peers in the punk community. It gained quite a bit of attention from the underground outlets and record stores. They even got a tour Europe with Black Flag, which established them as one of the front runners of this new scene. Mike said that he wanted their songs to communicate a certain idea. He said that he wanted them to, quote, make you think about what's expected of you, of your friends, what's expected of you by your boss, challenge those expectations and your own expectations. Man, you should challenge your own ideas about the world every day, end quote. But that challenging of ideas could lead to some really epic arguments between Mike and Dee Boone. On their tour with Black Flag, the Black Flag guys loved egging them on and getting them to get as heated and volatile as they could, but the two were best friends and they never really took the arguments all that seriously. That was the only tour they did with Black Flag, which was kind of unusual. Most SST bands would open for Black Flag as often as they could. I mean, it was Black Flag. That's an exposure unlike anything you're going to get in the scene. But Mike said, quote, You've got to do more than just be an opening band for a big band. We liked them very much, but no man's a hero to his valet. End quote. So they started to tour really heavily on their own, doing it as cheaply as they possibly could. They would crash on friends' floors. They would not hire any roadies, and they would lug and set up their own equipment. They called it Touring Econo, and that meant they were one of a very few punk bands who were actually making a profit on the road. It wasn't much, but it was something. In their live shows, they always brought energy and conviction. You could tell that they meant what they said. And that really got them the respect of other bands in the SST orbit. Talking about Dee Boone, Henry Rollins said, quote, This guy would give you half of anything he had. He was just a big, burly, big-hearted, jolly guy. Everyone loved him, end quote. Despite that attention and traction they were starting to build up, their albums didn't sell all that well. Obviously, Black Flag was outselling them, but also bands like The Descendants and Meat Puppies were outselling them. But they were something of a band's band. Your favorite band probably knew the Minutemen and probably really loved them, even if you had never heard of them. My father. 
They also found other outlets for their creativity beyond just music. Boone started a fanzine called The Prole, where he could write political articles and cartoons, and it lasted all of six editions. Mike started to do some record reviews for local magazines, and inspired by SST, they started their own label called New Alliance Records in 1980. And that was the label that nurtured the early career of the Descendants. Mike explained, quote, Part of being a punk band was also making a label. We never thought the label would get bigger, we just wanted to have it so that if you saw the band, you could get the record, end quote. And any profits that New Alliance got went right back into the label. In the fall of 1983, they had recorded enough material for a new album, but that was when Husker Du came into town and told them that they were planning on releasing a double album called Zen Arcade. They had recorded Zen Arcade in just three days, which the Minutemen took as a challenge. So they took the next month to write and record two dozen more songs. But Zen Arcade was a concept album, and the Minutemen admitted that they had no concept tying together their songs. But still, Mike says that that double album was the best thing he's ever played on. Double Nickels on the Dime was released in July of 1984 by SST. SST actually delayed the release so they could release Zen Arcade at the same time, thinking that releasing those two double albums together could, like, caused some promotion and publicity. It sold 15,000 copies in 1984, which was a pretty decent amount for an indie label band. And I think, personally, it's their best work. And then they toured relentlessly. On one tour, they played 53 dates in 67 days. They also settled into their persona and their dynamics during interviews, with Mike handling pretty much all of the talking. Boone would chime in whenever he had something to say or he needed to correct Mike, and George was just never there. Since Mike and Boone were such good childhood friends and were both interested in the same political thought, George kind of felt isolated at times. He was also just a more shy person, so he didn't necessarily want to be involved in all of these interviews. Since Double Nickels was such a resounding success for them, they decided to follow it up with something more experimental. In April of 1985, they released Project Mersh, which was their most commercial-sounding record. It was the brainchild of a guy named Joe Carducci, who noticed how much college radio stations loved the band and wanted to capitalize on that attention. So he suggested that he produce an EP with mainstream song links and production values. So they released this EP that was much more commercial sounding, but only sold half of what Double Nickels did. A few years before, they had done this interview in Georgia with a random kid named Michael Stipe. And then Michael Stipe became the lead singer of one of the hottest new bands in the country, R.E.M. Michael invited the Minutemen to open for R.E.M. on one of their tours, playing to like two and three thousand seat theaters. And the Minutemen had no idea who R.E.M. even was. That whole tour was quite a big struggle for them. Mike said, quote, The whole crew hated us, didn't want us on the tour. The record company, IRS, wouldn't put us on the posters. The only four guys who liked us was the band, end quote. Plus, their music was made for these smaller clubs. It was an erratic 40 songs in 30 minutes, full of energy and emotion, so it probably just didn't translate all that well to these larger venues. It was a really tough tour, but they survived it. In the fall of 1985, they returned to the studio to work on a new project, their fourth full-length album called Three-Way Tie for Last. They had several cover songs on this one, which was new for the band and the cover was painted by D. Boone. Some of the fans didn't love this album. They started thinking that maybe the Minutemen had run out of gas. The album was much more mellow and overproduced. Mike Carducci said, quote, I was really surprised. There just seemed to be nothing there. They hadn't really done much work on it, end quote. The album was recorded during kind of a rough period for D. Boone. People said that he had been drinking and partying way too much, and he'd gotten lazy, so Mike had to pick up the slack and push him to keep going. Because of how much he was drinking, he was having a hard time singing on stage. But Mike was still optimistic. They had started to make enough money to quit their day jobs, so they were really excited to dig down and really focus on the music, making the best songs that they could. They had started working on a new style that Mike said was very adventurous. Sadly, they never got the chance to explore that new style. In December of 1985, a few days after the R.E.M. tour ended, they were set to record with one of their heroes, a guy named Richard Meltzer. Mike went to Boone's house to kind of go over what they were going to do and maybe practice a few songs, and he found D. Boone 
sitting in a beanbag chair running a ridiculously high fever. D. Boone told Mike that he was headed to Arizona that night in order to spend Christmas with his girlfriend's family, but Mike worried that he was too sick to make the trip. D. Boone said not to worry, his girlfriend was going to be doing all of the driving, and D. Boone was just going to lay in the back of the van. So that's what they did. D. Boone, his girlfriend, and his girlfriend's sister got in the Minutemen's touring van and started making the drive to Arizona. On December 23rd, 1985, Mike's phone rang early in the morning. It was Boone's dad. Boone's girlfriend had been driving the van with Boone sleeping in the back and her sister in the passenger seat. Around 4 a.m., the van crashed and flipped. Boone fell out of the back, breaking his neck and dying instantly. When Mike heard the news about what happened, he said his mind flashed back to visions of D. Boone playing football in high school, and he said he thought he was as strong as an ox. Mike said, quote, he just seemed unkillable. He just did, end quote. Boone's girlfriend, Linda Kite, originally told police on the scene that she thought she fell asleep at the wheel, and that's the story that's still repeated and commonly believed. But she has since recanted that. In 2014, on the anniversary of the accident, she wrote a long post detailing what she says really happened. About falling asleep at the wheel, she said, quote, Yes, I did say that to the cops, and indeed it is what I thought happened, since I was very confused immediately thereafter. End quote. She then goes on to explain that what actually happened was that the left rear axle on the van broke, which was a common thing known to happen with those vans. And when that happened, she thought they had a flat, so she started to slow down. But what she actually felt was the wheel coming off, which caused the van to launch into the air. She said when the van went airborne, she blacked out, but when it landed, she broke her ankle, and it was the pain of that that woke her back up. She was able to hobble back to the road and flag down a trucker and some other good Samaritans, she told them that her sister and D. Boone were still in the van, so they went to investigate it. When the cops came, she was still shaken up, and they asked her what happened, and she said, I don't know, I must have fallen asleep, because that's the only thing she could think of that made any sense to explain what happened. She said that it was D. Boone's dad, who was a mechanic, who finally put the pieces together when he went to look at the van. She said that D. Boone's dad came to visit her in the hospital and asked her, so when did the wheel fall off? And then that kind of like snapped something in her memory and she's like, oh, that's what must have happened. That makes more sense. The accident as well as killing D. Boone also permanently disabled her sister. Whether or not you believe Linda's new story or you think that she actually did fall asleep at the wheel, I think it's safe to say that she's gone through more than enough trauma and heartbreak over the situation and I don't think anyone should ever add anything else to that. Of course, after D. Boone's death, Mike had no thoughts of continuing the Minutemen. He said, quote, no more of him, no more Minutemen. I had really come to lean on him. I was numb. I was weirded out. It was hard for me. Boy, that was hard. I miss him." End quote. In 1986, Mike and George formed a new band called Firehose. Over the next several years, that band worked really hard to develop their own sound and their own identity outside of being just the next Minutemen. They released three albums through SST before joining Columbia and releasing two more albums. And then in 1994, they broke up, citing creative stagnation. Since then, George has played with a band called the Red Crayola. He still plays with Mike quite frequently, but they play under the name Mike Watt and George Hurley. Even though they play a lot of the Minutemen songs, they won't ever play under that name without D. Boone. They also play in an improvisational group together called Unknown Instructors. George has been married since 1997 and has one son. After Firehose, Mike Watt focused on his solo career. He released a solo album that featured a lot of collaborations with SST artists like Henry Rollins and Eddie Vedder. He's gone on to record some things with other bands and play some live shows with different groups. In January of 2000, he had a pretty intense and invasive surgery due to an infection in his perineum. The surgery was very tough, and he had to build his strength back up just to be able to play the bass again. After that, he kept releasing solo albums and worked with his friends on some of their projects. There's honestly just way too many projects he's worked on to even name them here. He also hosts an internet radio show called The Watt from Pedro. During the Minutemen's short career, I think they taught people a super valuable lesson. They taught them that you could do this. This is something that's not unattainable for people. And there's no harm in just giving it a try. And that's the story of the Minutemen. Let me know if you liked it. Leave a comment on any bands you think I should cover next. And share this with a friend if you think they need to know more about the Minutemen.